this talk was originally given to a group of astronomy enthusiasts at Stonehenge Wairapa when they had their annual meeting out here in Carterton. And James Crampton actually saw the title and liked it and so thought it would make a good talk for this group. So yeah, I've, I've been working a little bit on the KT boundary and, and mainly in, in part of, in, in, in relation to my role now as in geoscience education, where I take teachers and school students out to places in the Wairapa to give them some insight into the geology and give them some ideas about things they can do that link into the curriculum. And this is a great one because out at Tora, we have this record of the KT boundary that is in submarine channel. And so there's, there's looking at the, at the unconformity that, that, that marks the onset of the submarine channel. And then there's the in, incredibly interesting KT boundary interval. And so it's great for, for looking at um, geological time, unconformity, sedimentary processes, and it's just a, it's great. And, and I've taken, I've taken teachers out there. I've taken primary school kids. I've taken secondary school kids and everyone seems to get a lot out of it. So I think, I think it's, it's a great place to take them. So, but I know it's a roundabout way of me. Um, I've got to do a lot of this has my background and in, in research on the KT boundary to get to the point as to why this section that, that I'm showing you here in the title slide is, is particularly interesting for the KT boundary. So we're going to step back right to the start. Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, or as I'll refer to it frequently through this talk, the KT boundary, which I've been familiar with, I've called it most of my career. 66 million years ago, second largest extinction event known. There's still debate about how many species died. Um, it depends on how you calculate them and what, what, yeah. So somewhere between 50 to 80% of life died out and including the non-avian dinosaurs, the ammonites, planktonic foraminifera and calcareous nanofossils and, and lots of other things. There were survivors and survivors included, of course, uh, small reptiles and, and, and birds and mammals that we'll come back to. And a lot of microscopic fossils, dinoflagellates, diatoms, and radiolarians. Most species of those microscopic groups survived the KT event. So the first question to address with the KT boundary is, was it caused by an asteroid impact? I had thought that was pretty well settled, but I, 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 I just had a look through Mike Hanna's recent book on extinctions and was surprised to see that, that he still wavered a little bit on whether, on the role of the, the asteroid impact in causing the extinctions. He thought that volcanism, the Deccan Traps volcanism might have a greater role in, in. so I'm going to go through that a little bit about whether it's asteroid impact or volcanism that, that, that killed off the dinosaurs. And then I'm going to briefly touch on, would we be here if the dinosaurs didn't go extinct? Because it's a whole topic and, and we'd, I'm just going to, I'm just going to really deal with it quite briefly, but what I'm going to focus more on is the significance of New Zealand's Paleogene boundary record and how relevant is it for, for addressing, for understanding what we know about the KT boundary, the KPG boundary. Okay. So asteroid impact versus volcanic activity. This is an early diagram by Norm McLeod, I think, showing the biotic record of extinctions back to the, the Cambrian and recorded bolide events and, and episodes of flood basalt eruptions. And you can see that at the KT boundary up here, you have a big bolide impact, an asteroid impact, but you also have a significant amount of volcanism and primarily the Deccan Traps volcanism about that time. The, the main arguments I think for giving a primary role to asteroid impact is that this big impact crater at the boundary, obviously right at the boundary. The impact debris coincides exactly with the extinctions and impact winter is the most likely cause of the extinctions, whereas flood basalt eruptions, typically they get, they, they're associated with global warming. They, they, they produce a, a small amount of dust, but they primarily produce a lot of CO2. And so they're, they're normally associated with, with greenhouse events. But yeah, as I said there. And, and, and the other important point is the volcanism began before and continued after the, the extinctions. 
And this has just been demonstrated in this 2020 paper to show that dinosaurs were thriving through the late Cretaceous, existing on three continents at least right up to the end of the Cretaceous. Whereas the Deccan Traps volcanism started around 66, 7 million years and continued into the, into the Paleocene. And, and, and you can see here that, that most of the time, the major episodes is associated with, with increases in, in temperature. Whereas the KT event, falling event, small blip in temperature, possibly related to the Deccan Traps, but evidence pretty clear in my mind that the primary thing that happens that's different at the KT boundary is the asteroid impact. And, you know, the, the evidence for this is, is pretty compelling. There's the, the, the C-note ring in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, the geophysical anomaly that, that is well displayed. And at sites like Blake Nose and an and IDP, IDP site, you see this really cool story of the, you know, I'm just gonna try and get rid of you. Or, oh, yeah. So the, the KT boundaries recorded here. So there's a pre-extinction layer with nice big Cretaceous planktic forams. Then there's the ejector layer with this uh, ballistic ejector being thrown out by the, by the asteroid impact. And then there's the fireball layer with the iridium anomaly at the top. And then there's a, a dead zone. And then there's the, the appearance of these smaller Paleocene forams. So all pretty consistent with an asteroid impact. New Zealand is important in, in this context because if, if the asteroid impacted in the Yucatan Peninsula, then we're a, a really good place to study the effects because we're a long way away. So we'll see the distal effects of the asteroid impact. And we'd expect, we'd expect a less disrupted sequence without those high energy deposits as you get around the Gulf of Mexico, but you'd still get the iridium anomaly and various elements like the spinels and spherules and the, and the microtectites and such from the, from the dust cloud fallout. So Woodside Creek is the section that, that came to prominence in 1980. It was actually in the Alvarez paper in 1980. It's just mentioned as a footnote, but it's always, it's always touted as the, the third site in the, in the story of how the, of the impact hypothesis that Louis Alvarez published. So Gubbio in Italy, Stephens Klimt in Denmark and Woodside Creek in New Zealand all had Iridium and enrichments at the KT boundary. And here, and just acknowledging Percy over here, who discovered the KT boundary in 1977, and this is it at Woodside Creek. Dale Russell subsequently came along and drilled these holes and collected the samples and analyzed them. And he's the one who, who found the iridium anomaly that's reported in the Alvarez paper. First, most compelling evidence that you can see at the KT boundary itself is if you look closely at the top Cretaceous, there's all these little impression dimples on the, on the surface of the Cretaceous. And we hadn't noticed this much of the time we'd been sampling. I, when I went there a few years ago with Jan Smith, who's been studying the KT boundary for many years, he pointed them out to me and we collected the sample and we thin sectioned it and we found these things over here. And these are um, impact spherules. And so on the top Cretaceous layer of the, the, the KT boundary at Woodside Creek, we find these impact spherules, which are glass that have been thrown out by the, by the asteroid impact into the atmosphere and then rained down in the ocean, in the South Pacific Ocean, and then filtered down, fell through hundreds of meters of water because this is a bathyal site and then settled on the seafloor in the Cretaceous. Can't get better evidence than that, I think. And so Woodside Creek, this is the KT boundary over here again. Shocked quartz has also been reported. Microtectites have been reported. And this is Robert Brooks's work on the geochemistry showing the iridium anomaly and several other siderophilic element anomalies at the KT boundary. Very distinct. And then in our work, we found that big spike in clay, big drop in carbonate content, and a big increase in silica content. Um, main point in showing this slide really is to show how stable everything is through the Cretaceous and then wham, wham things change abruptly and then there's a bit of instability and then things get back to normal. 
Okay, Woodside Creek was the, the first site, but there's multiple sites. And then the, the one that Percy and, and Robert, Mrs. Robert Brooks over here, spent a lot of time working on because they are, Percy considered it the most complete KT boundary section with a full sequence of four AM zones through the sequence, Flaxbourne River. Again, iridium anomaly, various other elemental anomalies, decrease in calcium carbonate due to the extinction of the, the planktonic forearms and the calcareous nanofossils, and then slow recovery. Now you'll note that um, there's a bit of a, a blurring out. Oh, there's, there's the iridium is not an abrupt spike. It, it sort of, it's spread in the late, sorry, in the late Cretaceous on this side, a little bit into the late Cretaceous. And that's because this is actually quite a weathered section. It's always been quite weathered. And so an elemental anomaly here is going to register down into the top Cretaceous. That's pretty reasonable, I think. And also a little bit of migration into this basal Paleocene, but it's all consistent with the asteroid theory, I think. So, and the other thing that, that's really cool about the Flaxbourne River section is just the abrupt changes in, in the siliceous plankton populations. Now, this, this abrupt change in the assemblage, so there's no extinction for radiolarians, but there's a big influx in spermilarian radiolarians. And this a change from Narcillarian dominance to Spermilarian dominance at the KT boundary occurs within three millimeters of the boundary clay. So there's three samples in here. So there's actually a sample here, a sample here, and a sample here. And it's just it's just remarkable how how abrupt that change is. I'm not going to go into the the reasons why that change happens. I'm just going to I just want to emphasize that this is a this is a major change in in the microfossil assemblages, precisely at the time that the iridium anomaly is, occurs. So again, strong evidence that the asteroid impact was the primary driver of the changes at the KT boundary. And other changes, decrease in carbonate content, um, increase in silica overall, increase in diatoms, and a major increase in, in spermilarians. This is just a picture of the, the flex, the, it's actually a quarry on, on Herb Thompson's farm. And it's just to demonstrate that this generally is a pretty weathered site. We were trying to collect a sample for the Australian Museum. They wanted a, a slab through the Flaxbourne River section, it being the most complete Southern Hemisphere section. And we, we spent a good day on it and couldn't get a decent slab. So we actually went to Early Point on the coast and got the slab from there where the rock's much better preserved. Here, in fact, here. So, John Symes, my son Ben, and, and, and Michelle Dow taking the photo, and we spent a very nice morning taking a great column se columnar section through the KT boundary that's now on display in the Australian Museum. Yeah, and so this is the KT boundary here, and Cretaceous this way, a metre thick dark silicious layer, and then oh, this is also silicious here before it gets back into, into limestone. And now, of course, this has been uplifted by the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016. And so there's much better exposure of this section that I've never actually seen, but Percy informs me that it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And if there was any funding for KT boundary research, I'd be back down there for sure. Okay. Also a, a, a suite of sections in the, in the Clarence Valley and in, in inland Eastern Marlborough, Mead Stream is the one we've worked on most. This is Mead Stream over here, here's the KT boundary. And here it is over here, but there's a series of sections as you go south, Branch Stream, Muzzle Stream, and Bluff Stream, which all give you different, different records through the KT boundary. Which we'll talk a bit more about Muzzle and Bluff Streams later on. Um, and then, of course, not to overlook the, the, the non-marine record of the, of the KT boundary, which again shows, so this is work that, that Vivi Vida and Ian Rain and, and I undertook with a nice study showing that we got the iridium anomaly and again, a, a pretty dramatic change in, in vegetation right at the boundary with a change from mixed forest to a dominance of ground ferns, then appearance of tree ferns, and then gradually conifer dominated interval before with lots of Huon pine and before the mixed forest comes back. And then finally, I just wanted to put in 
something on our latest work, which is the, the study we did of the midwife resection, which is a sort of out of shelf section in the late Cretaceous. And here we, we managed to finally get a temperature record through the KT boundary, which is, uh, which is pretty hard to do. And using the, the TEX86 proxy, we, uh, we found that we had a, a, so the impact winter would have probably lasted a very short period of time. So really hard to pick it up in the geological record, probably only lasted a year or two. But then following that, after everything's died, all the plants have died, then there's nothing taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it makes sense that there would be a greenhouse event following the impact winter. Um, and this is what we think we see here. We see a, a warming interval above the boundary. Now, again, if you look over here, you'll see that this boundary is highly biotobated. And so this is why we think we got, we've got some signal in the latest Cretaceous here. We also have records of Trithrodinium evitii, which is the, the, the dinoflagellate marker for the early Paleocene occurring in the latest Cretaceous here. And we think that's because of biotobation. Anyway, warming event, a hiatus, and then dramatic cooling event that I'll come back to later. But for the purposes of this part of the talk, just another dramatic change at the KT boundary. Okay, so this is this is the summary that Peter Schulter and, and others published in 2010, just summarizing the evidence for the asteroid impact, really, the, the abrupt extinction of, of species, coincident with a major geochemical anomaly, spike in iridium or changes in, in the overall geochemistry, spike in iridium, and then in contrast, the, the Deccan traps volcanism was occurring all the way through this interval and with different amounts of volcanic material being produced through this from the late Cretaceous into the, into the Paleocene. So, hope I've convinced you. Asteroid impact, magnitude 12 earthquake is what they think probably happened with a 12 kilometer diameter asteroid. The Yucatan shelf would have collapsed. Ballistic ejector would have caused local wildfires. The collapse of the shelf and the impact itself would have caused a a massive tsunami that I'll come back to in a minute, and and then the generated a global dust cloud that would have enveloped the Earth for at least a few years, sufficient to shut down photosynthesis and possibly associated with acid rain, but we still don't know for sure about that. And then the shutdown of photosynthesis would have been a killing mechanism for for most of the things that died. You kill the plants, and then you kill the things that eat the plants. The killing the plants would have also caused CO2 to build up, and so you would have had a subsequent greenhouse event. Okay, so it's funny not having an audience to see if anyone's still there, but I, I, I trust you're still there. So did the demise of the dinosaurs open the door for the mammals? Well, probably. If you look at many of the, these sorts of plots, you'll see that the, the mammals certainly survived and the dinosaurs died and they started diversifying from about this point. If you look at this kind of study, this is a brain evolution study showing that most of the, di the diverged expansion of, of mammals occurred in, in the early Paleogene around the time of the KT boundary. Now with the primates coming in in the, in the Paleocene here. And in more detail, this is a bit of a busy slide. So this recent paper, or 2016, shows that yes, probably dinosaur speciation was decreasing through the late Cretaceous. So maybe they were they were already suffering from something. Hard to know whether that was due to volcanism or not. But there's still quite a number of dinosaurs persisting to the end of the Cretaceous here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's a, that's right, I was confused by the scale down here. Okay. And then similarly for the mammals now, so there's a suggestion that, 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 that several mammal clades were also affected by the KT boundary, and that makes sense. You know, there's no reason that, that some mammals weren't also killed off by this massive event. And so there is this little blip in disparity, but overall diversity does a big jump across the, the KT boundary. And so this is really all I wanted to say about the title of my talk, that yes, the asteroid impact caused the ultimate demise of the dinosaurs that allowed the expansion of the 
mammals, including the primates. But what I really wanted to talk about was this big tidal wave over here. Isn't this cool? This is probably a bit bigger than it was in reality, but you get the idea. So the, the asteroid impact probably did generate a very large tsunami. Wouldn't have helped the dinosaurs, but they were probably on, going to be going out very soon anyway. So we, I was involved in a study that looked at modeling this tsunami. And so Molly Range and, and others from the University of Michigan brought me in to provide a little bit of distal context for their modeling study. And so they produced this model that showed that asteroid impact in the Yucatan Peninsula would have moved through the Atlantic Ocean and also into the Pacific Ocean and primarily to the Southwest Pacific. And this is New Zealand in the Scotties reconstruction. And showing that as you, as you get New Zealand to New Zealand, there's a big acceleration in, or increase in, in there's an acceleration of the tsunami and there's also an increase in the amplitude. And so they did these kinds of modeling experiments um, that show the simulation of the tsunami whacking into New Zealand. And so they argue that um, the impact would have generated a, a four and a half kilometer high wave at the impact site. Um, within 200 kilometers of the impact site, it would have still been one and a half kilometers high. And then 100 meter waves would have swept through the Gulf of Mexico, causing many of those um, proximal um, tsunami deposits that, that are, are well documented, documented in the Gulf of Mexico. And then as you get towards New Zealand, you would have still generated, um, when it's ramping up, um, at, at least 10 meter high a minimum of 10 meter high waves from the northeastern shores of New Zealand. Okay, or well this one is another um, version of the model. And heading into New Zealand after I think we calculated uh, 12 hours. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, hang on. 24 hours, sorry, to get to New Zealand. Okay, so that brings us back to where I started the start of the talk, which was at Tora on the southeastern coast of Wairapa. And this is a lovely colorized, colored map version of Ben Hines's very detailed map of the area, but reproduced by Carolyn Bolton. And the KT boundary has already been documented by various studies within the Manorabo Formation, which is this blue color going through here. And so it's, it's located in, in several of these streams. Pukimuri Stream has been, was study undertaken by a student of Mike Hanna's, Claire Wasmuth. And there's been a little bit of work at Tokoko Point down here. And then a student of Hank Brinkhouse's, Johan Valakou, worked on the boundary at Manorewa Point. And, and well, actually it's not Manorewa Point where the best outcrop of the KT boundary is. It's here on what is called the Athia Reserve, which is interestingly for those of you who ever come to the Wairapa, just down from Stony Bay Lodge, which was one of the um, lodges you stay at if you do the Tora Coastal Walk. So you've always got time to kill when you get here. So if the tide's out, it's worth going out and checking out the KT boundary while you're here. KT boundary is, ex is exposed all along the coast at this Afia Reserve. And some of it looks like this, which is quite familiar to those of us who have worked on the KT boundary in the northeastern, in the, in the east coast basin of the North Island, where it is typically a sharp contact overlain by green sand. And that's what we see here. So a close up of that, then you can see that it's sharp but irregular and erosional. Oh, yeah, you can see the erosional contact there. And then if you go further down the coast, you can see that the contact starts bringing in. There's 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 a pebble zone around at the contact all the way through here. A close up of that, and you can see 
significant numbers of pebbles at the boundary. And if you go further along, here's the boundary here, and you see these big, so this is this boundary is marked by this light double limestone layer. And you can see these lime this, these limestone beds have been ripped up, twisted around, and redeposited directly above the boundary. So here's the KT boundary, and this is the, the limestone beds being ripped up. And a close-up of this looks like that. And looking closer still, you can see that there's quite a lot of detail at the, at the boundary. So there's there's this this flow pattern through here, erosional contact at the KT bound at the at, on the top of that limestone. There's gravel layers, pebbles, and then there's these big lumps of limestone, these limestones here. So this is all pretty consistent with a massive tsunami whacking into the east coast of New Zealand. It's There are other interpretations because this is within a submarine channel, so you get, you get these pebble horizons all through the Lake Cretaceous. But this being located as it is right at the KT boundary does suggests to me that it's pretty 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 reasonable evidence for a for a for a tsunami deposit. What I think would have happened for this the complexity of this type of deposit would we've probably got a back surge rather than this being the the all the 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 forward force of the of the tsunami. What I think probably would have happened was it would have hit the coast and it was swept out back into the Sashing back and forth, perhaps, and and that disruption would have brought the that backflow would have would have brought the the rocks that are that we're seeing displaced here. Anyway, what is and this is a just a further close up of that contact. Pretty pretty interesting contact with a lot of small green sand grains in it. But the problem we have is we've only got this one site, and, and as I said, it's within the submarine channel, and that's part of the reason that we probably see it, because it's it's bringing debris down into the deep sea, where our, our problem with the east coast of New Zealand is we don't have shallow marine sections. And so I have now been spending quite a bit of time trying to think of where we might find a shallow marine section on the east coast that we could demonstrate for sure the evidence of a tsunami impact. Phil Moore did a lot of work on, on the, the KT boundary in the east coast of the North Island, and, and he, he noticed some, some, some interesting patterns that I think are quite consistent with this idea of tsunami impact. The first being that there's an unconformity everywhere, an erosional contact, glauconitic sandstone above, just like we see at Tora. And the other thing being this increase in carbonate content, which you noted in several of the sections. And as we saw in, in the more complete sections in Marlborough, we should expect a decrease in carbonate content because the things that supply carbonate, the forams, the planktonic forams, and the calcareous nanofossils died out. And so it, the only way that you can get an increase in carbonate content is if it's Cretaceous carbonate that's being brought in. And so that would be my explanation of, of carbonate, but not tested, hasn't been studied in detail. And also he, he noted several pebble horizons and disrupted bedding at various places. So Turi Stream is, is the type section of the Turian. So you would expect that this would be the place to go to, to really test the idea. Unfortunately, this is one of those sections where you get mudstone overlain by green sand. And it's, a, again, if you, this, took us a hell of a long time to identify and, and clear it up, cl clean it up. But once we did that, we could see that this, this horizon is, is, is erosional and, and probably some probably burrowed. And the, the forams here, the, the, the youngest, no, the oldest forams here, which is, comes in sort of a hundred thousand years after the KT boundary. And so suggests there's time missing, which is, yeah, was described by Norcott Hornibrook. Few years many years ago. So where would you go to get a more complete record of, of the KT boundary in the east coast of New Zealand? We've got the erosional contacts in the North Island, we've got these complete these more complete contacts in, in Marlborough, but they're all deep water. So I've been looking at, and I've discussed this a little bit with James Crankton, 
about the Clarence Valley sequence again. And so this is this is James's reconstruction, which is the same one that Ben Hines used. And this is the Clarence Valley sections here, and this is James's reconstruction of the blocks within the southeastern Marlborough. This is this was actually Palinus, uh, paleogeographic map produced by Ben Andrews. And Ben Andrew in his in his master's thesis, and I've just doctored it up slightly to to show what the 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 facies would have been like in in the earliest Paleocene. And you can see that we get the same pattern that we do in the East Coast Basin, where we have a transition from limestone here to green sand. This this is all green sand through here, and this so this is getting towards the shelf so if we're going to find a more complete section we might expect to find it here unfortunately we've we've looked at these sections and this is muzzle stream and bluff stream which are sort of the, the far end of this basin and so this is the, the same figure again and we find that there's a huge unconformity associated with these green sands so here at bluff stream it's it's you know almost it's 10 million years and even at muzzle stream, it's several million years. And this is unfortunate that we have no record of this time in Earth history because something subsequent to the KT boundary eroded the early Paleocene away. And this is probably this calling event that we identified in the in the midwife section and links in with the with the uh, with the Waipawa formation that, that we see in the late Paleocene. So this is our Tex 86 record. We think that that probably all through this interval from the late Cretaceous through to the latest Paleocene, there's some um, cooling events that are causing erosion, condensed sequences, green sand deposition. And so it's going to be really hard, I think, to find a shelf section through the KT boundary. And that's, I think that's where I'm going to leave it because now I want to get your suggestions on where you think I might go to find that record. So suggestions welcome, open for discussion. That's the map. Where would we go to find a shelf section of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary? Thank you. And I'd just like to acknowledge my, my funders these days, field-based STEM, which is good. Thank you.